in this convention, whenever there's a convention, God does things that are strange and different to normal days. And so when people come to convention, you are expected to come with an attitude as I prayed. The attitude you must have when you come to convention is that everything you had known is nothing. And everything you have experienced is nothing. When a Christian comes to a place that he feels that what he, the, the experience that he has, by it he has arrived, that is the day you have fallen. And really it is because you haven't got any experience yet. You know, we have seen in church God moving in diverse ways. I was sharing with them in the, in the meeting today. I was sharing about the mission statements of Christ Faith Tabernacle. And this led me to teach them about the letters to the seven churches. And I was sharing to them about the encounter of Brother John, Apostle John in the island of Pertimus. And I told the people that one of the reasons why many believers have not been encountering God in deep dimensions is because when we read sometime about the lives of people in the Bible, we read them as stories. We read them also as to draw some uh, understanding from it. But seldom do people understand that when you read about the people of old and you read about their encounter, if your heart is, man, these people are human beings. What is the difference between them and me? If they can have the encounters of this magnitude, then what am I doing on planet Earth? After all, they do not have the opportunities that we have. Because the Old Testament people didn't have the grace. And the New Testament people only had the testimonies of the Old Testament. That is, all the, all the, all the disciples of Christ and the church in the, in the New Testament. But we, in our time, we do not only have grace, but we have the experiences and encounters of all the old prophets, as well as the encounters of the apostles. And if we have the encounters of the old prophets and the apostles plus grace, if you look at what we are in our dispensation, then if you are truthful to yourself, you will pity, you will pity us. And the motive of convention is to take us into deeper dimensions. I've been in various world conferences on revival. But I've never been to any conference, among all the conferences, where the truth was faced. We have a lot of theories that we write about revival, books and volumes of books, but none of them solve it. Because the only thing that brought revival all the time is that somebody stood up in his generation to make a difference like the people of old. That is to prove to people that God is not theory. And because of them, revival has happened at different dispensation. And the key thing that we're all looking at in this, in this convention, which I could believe that I could say that is our driving force. In the book of Revelation chapter, chapter 1, let's look at that very quickly. Verse 9 says, I, John, your brother, and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are us in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Look at the next verse. It says, on the last day I was in the spirit. Everybody needs to experience this. Everybody needs to experience this. <laughs> Some of us have, but it has to be more regular. Than once in a blue moon. A physical man can suddenly, in a twinkle of an eye, be in the spirit. As it is that when you are in the physical, you can see physical things. So also when you translate from physical into the spirit, 
you will see some other things that natural eyes cannot see. This is not a fiction. This is a reality. This is not a gift. It is something that happens to, to people who decide to step up relationship. It is an experience, an encounter that God gives to a man because of an intimate relationship. And I, I, I believe in my heart, and I will say this to everyone who, is, who are God's children, that in this generation, we will never see revival until we begin to encounter these things. Not once in a while, but all the time. And it is the right of every Christian to experience this thing while you are in the earthly realm. Because it is not a gift for ministry office, because tonight I'm not talking about that. You know, ministry office, the Bible tells in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7, that is grace given. You don't work for it. You wake up and, and you see it manifest. And that's the reason why, also in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, all the gifts that we have, you know, we cannot boast of them. And we cannot pride in, in any of those gifts because we just found out that they happened and uh, we don't know how it happened. Of course, we understand the fact too that the Bible says God gives us a measure. You will be given a measure and you have to work out to go to higher measures. Are you getting what I'm saying now? You are given a measure of the gift, but you have to work hard to get into deeper measure. To every gift that we have or we carry, there is deeper dimension. There is a deeper dimension than what you ever get. And it is not, we don't enter these things by faith. We enter these things by work. We enter it by work. You must understand and not misunderstand the things that faith gives you. If you apply faith to what you have to work out, you will only be procrastinating. Let me give you an example. Somebody by faith should stand up and tell me what will happen tomorrow. Is anybody here who has such a strong faith? And you can tell, get up and tell me what will happen in London tomorrow? Your faith will never bring that. To know what will happen in London tomorrow, to stand up and say three days ago that there's an earthquake that is about to hit the coastline of Haiti, of, of um, Chile, just before it happened, does not come by faith. It comes by grace. To have the understanding of the spiritual, profound insight, and have the scripture in your head and understand does not come by faith. It comes by work, study to show yourself approved work, man. You cannot by faith know the stories of the Bible and have profound insight to relate one scripture to the other. No, you have to read it. Are you getting what I'm saying now? So for every portion of grace that is given to you, there are higher dimensions in the grace. Take for instance, the, 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 in the prophetic grace, prophetic grace is, a, is, a, is an office where in the book of Numbers, chapter 12, verse 6, it says that if there's a prophet among you, I speak to him by dreams, I reveal myself to him by visions. When a prophet is of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him by in vision, and I speak in dreams. So we understand the fact that there is the gift of prophecy where you can prophesy, I can prophesy, but yet we are not prophets. We understand the fact that when you are called to the office of prophet, the primary office, that is the primary school of prophets. You will be having visions in dreams, not nightmares. You will have dreams of things that will happen, they will be accurate, and they will be very clear. Not that you dream and you forget when you wake up. No, in prophetic office, when God in a dream reveals to you the vision of the night, we're going to go into that very shortly, Vision of the night, it shows you clean, clear things that will happen, time they will happen, and when you wake up and you say it, they will happen at the time in the very place you said. That is vision of the night. But then it also gives you open vision 
where you can stand in the midst of people who are praying together and then you are taken into the spirit like John said. That I was in the spirit on the day of the Lord. He was physically awake, but yet he was engaged in a, an activity in the realm of the spirit that natural eyes cannot see. We understand the fact too that the primary prophet will also be able to prophesy like the gift of prophecy. We understand also that as you go higher in the realm of prophetic office, you enter into the chamber of word of knowledge. Where by the mind of the spirit, you are able to understand and unravel some mystery, and you call that word of knowledge. But we also understand that there is a higher dimension, a university experience of prophetic in verse 11. None of us, um, um, uh, that, that numbers. Uh, that, yeah, the numbers 12, verse 7. And what did he say? He said, but this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. That is work, not faith. To be faithful is by work. Faithfulness comes as a result of working on faith. That is what is called faithfulness. When you have faith in God and you have faith in the word of God, your faith is not faithful until you apply the faith into your natural life so that your working with God is according to the faith that you profess. So your faith becomes full by your continuous acting upon the word of faith that you profess that you believe. Faith in the Lord is not believing God for miracles or believing God for provision. Faith in God is believing that God is what he says he is. And then... Second level of faith is believing that what he says you are is what you are. And third level of faith is acting according to what he says you should act. When a man combines these three levels of faith, then you become faithful in the act of faith. You see, the, 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 the faith to believe God for provision, faith to believe God for healing, Faith to believe God for miracles and stuff like that. Those, that faith is a faith that somebody who is not born again can have. And he can also get the miracles. It is a common faith that every mortal human that God created can turn to the God who created them at a point and just believe him. And he rescues them from predicament and calamity. But the difference between those people outside and you and I who God lives inside is that we do not only believe God in the area of natural provision. As it could be that they will believe God because of a pressing condition. We, because of the Holy Spirit, we believe God even when there is no condition to believe him. That's the difference between us and them. The second difference between us and them is we can believe God though there is no circumstance or condition that is pushing us towards that faith. But we can believe God because the word is written. But then God expects us to not only have faith and operate in faith, he also expects us to be faithful in our dealing, in our walking with him. If there is a higher calling, nobody can claim that he believes the higher calling without working it out. The Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians 16, flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom, neither will perishable inherit the imperishable. If you want to go to deep dimensions with God, there is no shortcut to it. Know that for sure. It's not according to your conviction because if conviction is the element to bring us into the place of high dimension, somebody should by conviction tell us what will happen in Russia by next year, January. You may be so convinced about it. 
but that revelation will not come to you. It comes when a man decides that you will not take God for granted anymore. When a man decides that God is holy and those who serve him should be holy. When a man decides that he has to crucify himself, himself, his flesh, his attitude and actions so that he can be partaker according to his might in the incorruptible holiness and the standard of righteousness as required by the Holy One. And your little effort before God is so appreciable by God. That does not mean you are perfect, but you, you, it, it means that you have made up your mind that as long as you know anything you know that is not right before God, you will not do it. And then that is when God can help your imperfection to bring you to the place that men will be looking at you and saying, what kind of a human being is this? Lord, you are the porter. And I am the clay. Mold me and make me. Have thine own way. Lord, I need your spirit. Lord, I need your spirit. And I can't make it without your grace. Lord, I need your grace. Help me to run. Help me to run. This Christian race. This Christian race. Lord, I give you my life. Lord, I give my life. And I give my all. I give my all to you. To be a willing vessel. To use, me through and through. to use me through and through. Lord, I need your spirit. Lord, I need your spirit. I need your grace. Lord, I need your grace. Help me to run. Help me to run. This Christian race. This Christian race. You are the part of. families have your way. Have your way. You know that we do have your way, Lord Jesus. Have your way. For we cannot do without you, Lord. history cities have been built for the habitation and advancement of mankind could you imagine an entire city built for a different purpose imagine a city built to educate and train the needy imagine a city built to heal the sick and rehabilitate the broken imagine a city built to increase business employment housing and health imagine a city built for the advancement of the kingdom of god it is time to stop imagining we would like to welcome you to Jesus City. Jesus City, Nigeria has been built as an awesome resource for the continent of Africa and the world. Schools, colleges, a university, hospitals with 1,500 beds, centers for orphans, widows, battered women, disabled, ex-offenders and old people, farmlands, industrial estates, centers for shopping, leisure and sports, hotels, housing for 2,000 people, 20,000 seater stadium, and much, much more. Jesus City, built to answer God's heart cry for Africa and the world. This God-inspired, pioneering vision was given to Apostle Alfred Williams, President of PBM Fellowship, 
with over 1,000 churches across the globe and senior pastor of the dynamic London City Church, Christ Faith Tabernacle. The church is built to address the need of God, what God needs. And people's needs will be met, Jesus said in the book of Matthew 7, when God's people know the kingdom and how to seek after God. For more information on Jesus City, visit jesuscity.org.uk or call 0181 39760. Jesus City, a refuge for nations. Coming soon. Between the years of 1984 and 1999, Apostle Alfred Williams was taken to heaven on various occasions where he was shown global events that would lead up to the year of 2015. And in 1999, the Apostle was powerfully shown the coming calendar for the world. I want you to understand that the first war was in heaven, the first victory was in heaven, and it takes the man of heaven to win the earthly battle. In December 2009, God instructed Apostle Alfred Williams to go into all the world and let them know that I am coming. Beloved, with this powerful instruction behind us, it is now time for us to arise, shine and win every house for Jesus. Now is the time for the final preparation of the Bride of Christ. A final trumpet call to righteousness in this time that is running out before the rapture of the church. Join us on this dynamic campaign to reach every house in Britain. They need to hear the call. Who will tell them if we do not? This is the prophesied time of harvest. It is now time for us to win every house for Jesus. For more information, call 020 7635 0447 or visit cftchurches.org. The time has come to arise, shine and win every house for Jesus. Behold, I am coming soon.
Let me say some things to you. I want to take you to the realm of the, the mystery and spiritual. And that's what I will concentrate on right throughout this period. Do you know something? God is looking for people on earth that he can be proud of. God is looking for people on earth that he can tell the devil, do your worst. He is going to stand. But you know that that is a state of mind. It begins from the state of mind. What you make up your mind to achieve is what you achieve. What you make up your mind to reject is what you can reject. What you make up your mind to submit to is what you can submit to. It begins from the realm of your mind. So then, therefore, the Bible is true by telling us that righteous act is not perfection of man, but it is a determination of man to do things right in the, in the sight of God. So what I'm saying by this is this. In this conference, we want to look at people in the scriptures who had encounters in God, and we do not want to believe in our heart that they are special before God because we are more privileged than them, not only for the fact that we are born in this season of grace, but we are the end time people. That God will mingle the old and the new through us and he will manifest and shake the whole world. Amen. This is the world we are living in. When evil is increasing and the signs and wonders of Satan is developing in an increasing measure on a daily basis. And no Christian can forecast the next wonder that will come from the pits of hell. So, if we are addressing the same generation that Satan is doing all this, unless your religion is beyond that of Pharisees, Jesus says, you have no part in this new move. Having said that, what is the heart of God for us? Deuteronomy 29, 29. It says, the sacred things belong to the Lord our God, but things revealed belong to who? <coughs> belong to who? Things revealed belong to who? I don't see, I don't think that, I think some folks here, maybe they have gone to, um, is it Karachi? <laughs> hey, let's come down a little while. Shall we read this together? Mm-hmm. Does that confirm what I've been telling you? Yes. Who are us? Let me, let me say this to you. Now this is the place of faith. For any part of the scripture to work for you, you must have faith that that scripture is talking about you. That's the first thing. Even if you are not qualified, faith in the word Overrides your disqualification. I say that again. Faith in the written word overrides all your disqualification. Because the disqualification of man always is coming from the perception of other men. Which has been infused into your, to your mind about you. It doesn't matter how many people don't believe in you. As long as you believe in the word. <laughs> Listen to me. That scripture says some things. Number one, the first thing it says is that there are some things that are secrets. Or mystery. Some translation says. But it tells me also something very sure. That those mysteries and secret things belong to only one person. And it's God. So Satan cannot access this mystery. This is not one of the mysteries that mediums can understand, or witches can understand, or wizards can understand, or any astrologer or astronomer. Hello? There are some mysteries beyond the ephemeris that no scientist can access. And he says, 
These things are hidden things. But they belong to God. That is the picture of the God of heaven that I see when I look at the scripture. Who has the knowledge of every human being on earth? Six billion human beings. And if you go to the mind of God, there is a chamber in the mind of God where the name of each one of them is written and the plans of their life is written. Every human being. Not only those who are living now, but those who have ever lived from the time of Adam till now, whatever trillion there might be. This is a God whose mind is so robust and so voluminous that in his mind, he has the chamber file of every soul that lived until now and that will live to the end of time. He also has all this information about all the angels that he had created, both those who are fallen and those who are standing. He also has the information about what will happen in every nation. He has the information about how each human being will behave and react every day till they die. Listen to me. Those things that he has written and those things that you will do, which he did not write. He knows them right in his heart. There is a God that we serve. Who has in the volume of his mind about all the creation. Every leaf that is created. Every tree that is created. Every star. Every meteor. Every comet. Everything in the ephemeris. All the asteroids. He has them in his heart. He even has all the birds and the fishes of the sea. And all the microorganisms. All these things live within his heart. He has the knowledge of everything and imparted his heart for them. To the extent that Jesus even said, For any hunter to decide to shoot a sparrow and for his bullet to hit the sparrow and for the sparrow to die, it is determined in his heart. He knows it. He knows it. He knows about the hunger that will come to every lion in this world and every animal that will fall a victim of being eaten up on a daily basis. Imagine it in your brain now. I'm just talking a little about him. He has in his heart every con continent of the globe, every nation in the world, every mineral under the ground. He can take us to the very spot where those minerals are. That have not been discovered by a prophetic. Hello. Listen to me. He has the knowledge of every plan that Satan will plan against you before the Satan plans it. I'm talking about your God. Somebody asked me, Apostle, what is the what is the what is the propeller behind your boldness? That's what I'm telling you. I can't have a God like that and fear anything. For me to fear anything, I do not understand that God. That's what it means. For me to fear anything is to disgrace him. Especially when death surrounds me and threatens my life. And is real and vivid. For me to fear is to deny him of his pre-knowledge of what I'm about to encounter. And also of the fact that there is a way out. That he had created. The sacred things. Mysteries are things that are yet to be understood. They belong to only one being. Your God. Your God. <laughs> wow. That's the reason why when God begins to talk to me about nations. I rejoice. And tells me about those who will win election in nations. Man. In a short time, we'll begin to tell them on television before it happens. And we cannot be charged for malpractice of election. Uh, hello. And this is what I want our eyes to, to, to target, our heart to, to look into. Sacred things belong to God. But things revealed belong to who? To me. Hello? Hey, hey, hey. Things with you belong to who? Mm. So, it is not a privilege to know mystery if you are born again. Is it right? When I was growing up in the Pentecostal church, because the knowledge was not much at the time, when somebody says, Thus hear the Lord, every one of us will cover our head and hide under the pews. 
Because God has just descended. He wasn't there before we thought. And nobody told us that he's been there all the time. Nobody told us that that which he's doing through that guy, he can do through anybody. So those people who prophesied and said, thus said the Lord, it's only by God's mercy we didn't worship them. I always thought that they, have been, they are different human beings. So if I fight with anybody, I don't fight with those guys. <laughs> you know? <laughs> don't touch. They are the, um, what do you call it now? They are the untouchables like they cast off in the, you see? But I soon grew up to understand that this mystery is for everybody that I teach you. He says, this reveal belongs to us. Everybody that is part of him is us. And also to who? For two days? For one month? Not only in this world, but in the one to come. We will continue to know mystery when we get to heaven. Let me say something to you. Some of us will be doing window shopping in heaven for two million years. You are only doing window shopping. <laughs> and new things you are seeing every day. <laughs> that is human day. Well, you, you may think when they talk about heaven, it's just one small little church. Isn't it? But I would say the heaven is his room, but the earth is his fools too. So you can imagine how big the earth is, and that is where God put his leg. <laughs> Hello? And you are living the place where God put his leg. You are like an ant who have been walking around the foot of a man, and he said, what a big place. And then he has to now walk from the foot, from the leg to the head of the man. <laughs> And then go to where the man lives. Oh, wow, what a big place. So if you have been looking at heaven like, you know, one small place like an auditorium where we we'll all worship and a little village like your mother's village, well, I'll say something to you. <laughs> heaven is, is more than that. It's more than that. But it says here, things revealed belong to us and to our children forever and ever. S for the reason, so that we may what? That is work. That is the work I'm talking about. The reason why God reveals mystery to a man is to woo you to holiness. The reason why God will show himself to you and reveal things to you is so that you may strive for more. So he shows you one thing today. Wow, to excite you. But then he now wants you to work harder and come closer in the fear of him. In the awe of him. All right? So that you may what? See more. And as you're coming closer, he's moving further back. So that you can come closer, he's moving further back. Mm -hmm. As you're coming closer, he's moving further back. And the further back he moves, the more you see. Until he goes into his room. And then he leads you into his chamber. And then he sits on his throne and you can see everything. But you see, John says something. The revelator in Revelation chapter 1. Look at it again. To follow the law, it says, I, your brother, John, your brother, and companion in suffering. There is suffering in following the word. There is suffering in following him. There is a lot of suffering. Following Jesus is not a bed of roses, like some people say. There is a period of having, there is a period of no having. There's a period of starvation. There's a period of plenty. Listen to me. There's a period of pain. Don't you think to come near to him is just easy. Your flesh has to die on a daily basis. And you must be ready to be buried so that you can live in the realm of the spirit. That is the reason why Paul says nobody who entangles himself with civilian affairs can satisfy his commanding officer that sent him. Isn't what he says. Your companion is suffering. And kingdom. There is suffering before the kingdom. And in the kingdom, patient endurance. Suffering, then into the kingdom. And then in the kingdom, patient endurance. 
God reveals things to you. And he says, now I will do it. But the now means 25 years. Okay? So because you don't understand the language of the spirit, after two years, I didn't happen. He said, God didn't speak, but he spoke. What did he say to Abraham? I will make you what? Into a big nation. I will bless you. And he says to Abraham, now look up the clouds. And he saw many stars. And he said, your children shall be like this. I thought according to my dialect, when you say your children, it means the one you born. The one you born. Hmm? How can a man give birth to children that will fill this guy? How many women will give birth to that? But you see, his ways are not our ways. That is how your kind of mind can understand. And then Abraham ran out with excitement from his parents who hired a worshiper. And he says, God has spoken to me. Come on, Sarah, let's go. Lord, what about you? Lord, say, I follow. He says, what did he say to you? I will bless you, he said. I will, I will make you into a big nation. And he says, I will cause those to curse you and bless those to bless you. Wow, that is interesting. God. And then we moved and they moved with him and they trusted him. And the first place they landed, there was famine. Oh, it's the devil who brought the famine. Lie. Who told you the devil? The devil has hand in what God is doing. Who told you that? As far as I'm concerned, in my own life, there is nothing that happened that devil did. Nothing. The only person that do things in my life, me, God. Finish. My life, my wife don't do nothing. She has her own life to do something. You get what I'm saying now? No, 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 no. Because if, if my, my wife has a duty to do at home, I have a duty to do. If I come in and my wife can't cook food, maybe because she has any other engagement to do or she's tired, I don't scream my head off. I pick the food myself, do it with my hand and eat it. I've been doing that before I'm married. And that cannot stop my marriage. And I start to, to, to groan over the woman. And I think that she's a, she's a block. She doesn't get, she mustn't get tired. I'm the only one who must get tired. So that's how some Christian men do, isn't it? Yeah. No, 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 no. You are the only one who, the women, the women never get tired, you know? Yeah. Are you getting what I'm saying now? There are conspirators behind me. Listen to the heavenly voice.
history, cities have been built for the habitation and advancement of mankind. Could you imagine an entire city built for a different purpose? Imagine a city built to educate and train the needy. Imagine a city built to heal the sick and rehabilitate the broken. Imagine a city built to increase business, employment, housing and health. Imagine a city built for the advancement of the kingdom of God. It is time to stop imagining. We would like to welcome you to Jesus City. Jesus City, Nigeria has been built as an awesome resource for the continent of Africa and the world. Schools, colleges, a university, hospitals with 1,500 beds, centers for orphans, widows, battered women, disabled, ex-offenders and old people. Farmlands, industrial estates, centers for shopping, leisure and sports, hotels, housing for 2,000 people, 20,000 seater stadium, and much, much more. Jesus City, built to answer God's heart cry for Africa and the world. This God-inspired, pioneering vision was given to Apostle Alfred Williams, president of PBM Fellowship with over 1,000 churches across the globe and senior pastor of the dynamic London City Church, Christ Faith Tabernacle. The church is built to address the need of God, what God needs and people's needs will be met. Jesus said in the book of Matthew 7, when God's people know the kingdom and how to seek after God. For more information on Jesus City, visit jesuscity.org.uk or call 0181 39760. Jesus City, a refuge for nations.